Uh, my name is Katie. I am here at Longwood Gardens and joined with us today is Nancy Agnew. Um, thank you for joining us for Ask the Expert. This is a series of conversations with Longwood's network of experts, and this is exclusive to members uh, answering a number of questions on home gardening topics. So uh, this week we are talking about soils and fertilizers, uh, something that Nancy is an expert on and teaches here, um, both in our professional horticulture program and in our continuing education program about. Um, so uh, a little bit about Nancy. Nancy holds a PhD in horticulture from Kansas State University. She's a lifelong educator and has taught classes, classes in herbaceous ornamentals, floriculture crop production, greenhouse management, tropical plants and interior, interior landscaping, horticulture home horticulture and horticultural mathematics. Um, quite the tongue twister there. Uh, and as I mentioned, she is also an instructor in our professional horticulture program and our continuing education program. So Nancy, thank you so much for joining us again. Yep, glad to be here. Uh, so we have gotten a lot of those questions that were submitted with registration and we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, we are going to leave some time at the end for any questions that come in through our chat or the Q&A. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure to leave a little bit of time at the end. This is also being recorded and so it will be available on our website at your leisure after we are done today. Uh, and to get us started, so Nancy, can you just talk a little bit about um, the best soil and fertilizer to use for container plants? Okay, well, I look for a well-drained potting mix. It needs to have a nice balance of water holding capacity and air holding capacity in order to be considered, you know, one of the better products for me. If I were to describe it, it would have about 70% sphagnum peat moss and about 30% perlite. And you can look for those ingredients on the bag of commercially prepared uh, potting mixes. I also like potting mixes that substitute a little bark for each of uh, those products, the peat moss and uh, the perlite. So if you see three components, aged bark, um, sphagnum moss, and perlite, that would be a, a good choice for you. So again, look at the packaging. If you were to ask me which brands I prefer, I tend to like a product called ProMix. It's from a company called Premier Horticulture. And I do like uh, the miracle Grow products um, that come from the Scotts Corporation. So if you're asking me a brand. And those are available in lots of different places. Your independent garden center and your big box stores both carry those brands. Now, did you ask me about fertilizers yet? Um, yeah, so best soil and fertilizer to you. So we've covered, so we've got potting mix there, a couple different options. Uh, how about for fertilizers? Okay, so these systems in which we're growing plants, the potting mix, uh, the pots, and our plant materials, this whole potting mix system doesn't hold or inherently contain a lot of nutrition. So I feel that um, you have to fertilize you know, on a regular basis with these. And I feel the right delivery method is using water-soluble products. So these are typically granules that you will put in the right amount into you know, a gallon of your irrigation water. Um, the other advantage to these products is that they not only have three essential elements, N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but they also uh, contain a whole cadre of uh, minor elements that are typically not found in potting mix. So um, in terms of uh, brands that I will seek, um, I seek um, Jack's products from J.R. Peters, and it's notable that J.R. Peters is a Pennsylvania-based company. Um, the Miracle Grow products from Scott's. And then my second choice of fertilizers would be those controlled release products, those little prills that you can buy. And the classic brand of those is Osmocote, which is um, you know, a Scott's product at the homeowner level. Great. Great, so a couple of options there too for fertilizers, uh, and that is just for container plants. We started sort of, uh, I guess, 
small in a way um, before moving on to some other um, planting and uh, in larger contexts and larger um, in gardens and yards. So um, as a follow-up question to what can be done to help soil retain its moisture? And this question is from Barry in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Okay, well, thanks for that question. Uh, there are products that help uh, your potting mix hold on to water. They're generally referred to as soil moist brand. I believe the miracle Grow product is named Water Absorbing Crystals, and they're also known generically as hydrogels. So these are acrylic polymer compounds that um, swell up to hundreds of times their original weight in water. So if you were to tear apart a baby diaper that was wet, let's say you wet it with water, <laughs> that's the material that's, that's the absorbent material in a baby diaper. So um, you can take these uh, crystals and you can incorporate them into your potting mix. And they basically allow for um, kind of a slower um, dry down of your potting mix without waterlogging the mix. Mm -hmm. um, there are, uh, these, these products are incorporated into some already prepared uh, potting mixes. So look for those that use the phrase moisture control. Mm -hmm. So they're already in there. So why would we use them? Um, they're really helpful in hot and dry conditions where our pots, particularly ones outdoors, tend to dry quicker when it's hot and dry. And uh, so it helps us avoid water stress in plants, which degrades their quality. And then if you're kind of an inattentive waterer, it kind of gives you a little forgiveness if you happen to forget to water in a timely manner. I like that, something that helps you out when you're, <laughs> when you might, might not be paying as much attention. <laughs> um, sounds like a great product. Um, what is a good fertilizer for potted geraniums and where would you purchase one? So this is from Maria right here in Kennett Square. Okay, so um, I was looking to, I know I can name a commercial product, ones we use in the greenhouse, but I had to do a little homework to find one that consumers can quickly get a hold of. And the best one I found was Jack's Blossom Booster. So Jack's Blossom Booster it has an analysis of 10, 30, 20. So um, 10, the 10 on that um, analysis means 10% N or nitrogen. The 30% means 30% um, phosphorus uh, in the form of pentaoxide, but you don't need to know that. And then the 20% the refers to potassium or the K portion of it. So the nitrogen favors great foliage, but you notice it's in a lower amount at 10%. And then phosphorus favors great root production and some flower production and potassium is also helpful um, with that. So you'll notice how the ratio of nitrogen is lower and the ratio of the other two components are higher. So that's kind of a hallmark mm -hmm. for flowering plants. And um, if you're looking for this product, if you're looking for the Jack's products, they come in the consumer size in your independent garden centers. So just give your favorite one a call and see if they carry that line. Um, I did a little online work and I could find them at Amazon. And I'm sure some of the big box stores also would carry the product. Great. And that's just Jack's Blossom Booster or is that a similar, like there, there are similar other brands out there that have that same. Yes, the Jacks would kind of be my favorite just because I took a closer look at the label. Mm -hmm. However, there are other companies that produce similar products. So look for those ratios that kind of don't favor nitrogen and advertise that they're better for flowering plants. Great, great. Yeah, it sounds like the, the ratio is what, what to look for. Um, exactly. And then um, for house plants, how about what is a good fertilizer for indoor plants and how often should you use it? And this is from Susan, also here in Kennet. Uh, I look for a couple of things. You can look for a uh, product that's useful for house plants. And you kind of have to distinguish between whether they're plants grown with just foliage, you know, like our philodendrons and our pothos, or whether they're flowering plants. So there will be some differences there. Um, the other thing you could use is what we refer to as general purpose feed. 
So most of the um, water soluble general purpose feeds have an analysis of 202020. So the Jacks brand has a foliage plant special and has a general purpose feed, and you will find similar compositions for other water soluble products. For example, Miracle Grow also carries them. As far as how much to use, I always tell people to read the label. And um, typically we we would add it at a very low rate and put it in our water that we would use for every uh, watering of our plant. Or um, if you either water very infrequently because it's a really large plant, or you don't add the fertilizer with every water, then you would use the higher end of the range. Um, the other thing to look for is, you know, how much light does your plant get? Is it actively growing? Is it establishing? So establishing plants need a little less actively growing, need a little more, and those that have kind of settled out and are in their kind of max size or are in, you know, winter conditions where the light's lower and the temps are lower, um, then we go back to the lower rate there. Great. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the difference between, um, I guess, so for fertilizers, organic fertilizers, and then chemical or synthetic fertilizers, uh, and, and just a little bit about the advantages and the disadvantages of, of those. Uh, okay. And that's from uh, Lori in Oakdale, New York. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, organic products uh, are, you know, becoming more and more available, and they can also be found, you know, for the houseplant side of things and the container plant side of things, which is not true, not that long ago, and of course the gardening side of things you know, the outdoor in the soil gardening. So there's a lot more products in that, you know, outdoor in the soil line. So as far as the plant's concerned, it doesn't see any difference between organic or synthetic fertilizers. The um, plants can only absorb these mineral nutrients in um, cations or anions. Those are uh, positively charged ions or negatively charged ions. Um, and these are the only plant available forms of the nutrients that they can absorb. So regardless of whether you're applying a synthetic product or you're applying a um, organic product, it has to be in that form, okay? So now to distinguish between the two, um, the differences are primary, primarily in the sources of the mineral ions. And then the availability or the release rate, like how quickly are they available in the plant available form? And then there might be some other benefits, like potential benefits for plant micro or soil microbiology. So the organic fertilizers um, generally have their mineral nutrients that come from the earth, from plants, or from animals. Okay, they're all processed materials but the source um, doesn't require, say, a chemical reaction. It requires some processing, but not a chemical reaction. And um, for example, nitrogen sources include bat guano, poultry litter, and alfalfa meal. So you can kind of tell those are plant and animal sources. And then um, when they compose an organic product, sometimes they'll put some additional goodies in the bag. And those are some of our beneficial soil microbes. So they'll add those to the bag. Um, compost can also serve as, as an organic fertilizer because it contains lots of nitrogen and certain um, types of compost may contain significant amounts of phosphorus or potassium. So, uh, and then of course the added benefit of compost is it improves soil till. Now, um, we have to be patient with our organic products because only a portion of the nitrogen, say for example, is available. It's a real slow to release. It usually requires some micro microbial action of soil to release. And the analysis of these products is quite low. So you need uh, a greater quantity of them as compared to synthetics. So there's some definite um, pluses to um, the organic forms. Now the synthetic fertilizers 
are created are usually um, from a chemical reaction between mined minerals or anhydrous ammonia and some other compound to create these fertilizer salts. Um, the other types of synthetic fertilizers might be complex mineral or complex molecules that um, deliver, say, for example, the micronutrients. So um, the advantage of them is uh, they're, they're usually in the readily available form that plants can absorb. Um, there are some that are quicker release and slower re release. Scientists have figured that out so you can get that, those qualities about it. Um, synthetic fertilizers are higher in analysis, so you would use less. And um, other than that, there's, there's really nothing wrong with one or the other. However, I like to, um, I even combine uh, the two. I think a combined approach is really great. So there's pluses and minuses to both, and um, they're both equally useful in our garden culture. Yeah, I, I like that combined approach. It sounds like there's definitely benefits to both. Um, random question, but what is bat guano? Uh, to put it delicately, bat poop. Okay. <laughs> I figured it had to have been something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, see how they collect it. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but as I mean, you know, if they found out that it's useful, I guess it, it serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, great. Next question is from Laura in Wilmington. How do I know what type of soil I have? Uh, and do I assume it's the same kind of soil in each area of my garden? So thinking about, um, you know, potentially gardening in different areas. Yeah, um, your, the characteristics, characteristics of your soil can differ depending upon the location in your yard. Um, what generally differs is things like soil texture, and that's the relative amounts of sand, silt, and clay. Um, the pH can be different. Uh, we often have soils that were disturbed by construction in our yard, and those are distinctly different than those that are, have been undisturbed. So as a result, um, when we're kind of checking out the quality of their soil or when we're, we're performing soil tests, we will actually zone parts of their, our yard based on location and then what's growing um, and then send those samples off separately for soil testing. So definitely there's, there's different things. So just as an example, um, we take our property, we design, divide it into zones. And then once we select a zone, we will take multiple samples within that zone and combine them and send them in as one. Okay. So you want to, you want to understand that. And then in terms of what a zone might be, a zone might be your front yard, or it might be your backyard in terms of the lawn areas. Sometimes lawn areas will have different conditions, but lawn would be a broad category. Um, a vegetable garden, you want to keep that sample separate. Uh, a rose garden, a shrub border, if you've got fruit trees growing somewhere, you definitely kind of want to isolate those and and collect soils from those zones and send them in as separate samples. Now, if you're really interested in understanding um, something about your soil texture, you know, the amount of sand, silt, and clay, there's um, something you can actually, by manipulating the soil in your hands, it's, it's called a ribbon test. And it's kind of deciding whether you think it's more clay, more sand, or silt, um, just by feel. And if you're interested in exploring that, I kind of searched to find a really great extension bulletin on that. And my alma mater, Kansas State, actually has um, an extension bulletin called Estimating Soil Texture by Feel. So it, it demonstrates that little technique. And um, so in case it's not obvious to you, most of us is fairly obvious when something's quite clayy because we have a lot of that around here. But if you're interested, we can go to that extension bulletin. And, Great. Explore it a little more. Yeah. Um, and then a little bit more on soil testing. So where, where would one get a soil test? Um, and what information can you learn from a soil test versus what you can't 
necessarily learn from it. Yeah, soil tests um, are often uh, available through your um, state land grant university, and I'll name a few in a couple of minutes. Um, the other uh, place, there are independent labs that also offer the service. If I were looking for an independent lab, I'd probably go to my state university to ask which ones were the better ones. So, um, but most state labs um, offer the service and um, at fairly minimal cost. Uh, uh, the state of Pennsylvania, which um, Penn State University has the uh, testing lab, it's only $9 to do a typical soil test. So in terms of uh, where our land grant institutions lie kind of in this region of the United States, for Pennsylvania, it's Penn State. For Delaware, it's the University of Delaware. For New Jersey, it's Rutgers. Uh, New York, it's Cornell. Massachusetts, University of Massachusetts. Connecticut, University of Connecticut. Rhode Island, it's University of Rhode Island. Virginia, uh, Virginia Tech. And Maryland um, is the University of Maryland. Now, turns out the University of Maryland doesn't have a state testing lab. They have wonderful materials on where you might go for a commercial lab or a neighboring state like Delaware, for example, mm -hmm. and helps, you know, there's a lot of great gardening advice um, from the University of Maryland. They just don't happen to have mm -hmm. a testing lab on campus. And um, I, just a quick question too about taking a soil test. I know we'll also talk about what to expect from the results, but if somebody's never taken a soil test before, what are they, what would they be doing? Okay, so let's say we've decided that our vegetable garden is the, is the zone. That's where we want to take a soil test and better understand that soil. So what I tend to do is you can simply use a, uh, a trowel to sort of take a vertical slice of soil in several locations in your uh, vegetable garden. When I take that vertical slice, I tend to kind of take the top inch or so and get rid of it. And then the remaining, I tend to, I will put in a big plastic bucket. Now the reason I do that is I'm wanting to pull a soil um, profile from where the roots reside. Mm -hmm. So the roots of most vegetables are gonna be what? Between six inches and maybe eight or 10 inches deep. So that's where I'm pulling my soil sample. So I'm gonna take random locations um, all over the garden, get rid of that top layer, put them in a bucket, mix them all together. We usually air dry it and then take a, a nice full one cup sample from that. Mm -hmm. I, usually, I personally just put it in a Ziploc, a Ziploc bag and then I pull the paperwork off their online sites, fill it out and mail the whole package in. Okay. So pretty simple. Yeah, no, that is, and, and it's, it's nice that there's literally for every state or most states out there that, it, well, especially in our area, um, you know, there is definitely somewhere to send them to to get your results. Yes, and there's some great online tutorials as well. I, in my little online search, I noticed that Penn State had a great video on how to take a soil test. Oh, great, yeah. That Lots of online learning tools. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't even think about that. Um, so then you sent, you've taken your soil test, you've sent it in um, to your local university. What would you then expect from the results? Okay, um, generally speaking, um, you know, this is a general statement across all testing labs, you're gonna get soil pH. Then you're gonna get phosphorus and potassium, potassium and then some of the other major elements, usually calcium and magnesium. So you'll get those levels in your soil. Um, you'll notice that nitrogen's left out of the list with N, P, and K being the three biggies. But um, nitrogen is um, too mobile in the soil and it resides in the soil in different forms. And it's sort of hard to capture that value and make any use of it. Now the plants do use a lot of nitrogen, so you will see um, kind of a general recommendation in your soil test for you know, the basic nitrogen needs of whatever uh, plant you're growing. So um, you also get the value for cation exchange capacity. 
of your soil. That's reflective of how well your soil holds on to plant ions, plant nutrition ions. So um, what affects CEC? It's the amount of clay in the soil. Believe it or not, clay provides lots of CEC. And then it can be reflective of the percent organic matter. And um, so when you submit your sample, uh, one of the things that's required of you is that you tell the testing lab what exactly I intend to grow in this space or what am I currently growing in this space? Because um, the recommendations they'll give back to you based on the test are based on what you're growing. For example, if it's um, rhododendrons you're growing, it's gonna give you a recommendation based on that plant. And uh, if it's a lawn you're growing, say a bluegrass lawn, it's gonna interpret the results based on that plant. Mm -hmm. So you wanna make sure that you fill out that part of the form to say, what am I growing in this soil? Because you're gonna have some customized recommendations um, from the lab for um, those plants. And um, there's some optional tests you can ask for. Uh, one that I will ask for for certain garden beds is percent organic matter. That kind of lets me know how well I'm doing improving my soil with organic matter. Typically, suburban homes like mine have very little organic matter in the soils because they're so disturbed. So uh, look for that one. If you, look, if you live in urban areas and you're wanting to grow food in the soil, I certainly would get a test for lead mm -hmm. and, and maybe some of the other, um, you can ask your extension service uh, what they recommend, but um, there might be some other heavy metals mm -hmm. that you'd want to have tested um, if you're, if you're, you know, using, if you're in an urban location. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and would you say that would go for like community gardens too? Oh, uh, you mean the lead test or just? Yeah. Yeah, like the heavy metals. Um, I would say it's better to be safe than sorry, so why not? Yeah. Um, and the likelihood of it to be a problem has more to do with what had happened on that site before, uh, if the soils are disturbed or if it's in, you know, an urban location. But it's mm -hmm. never, whenever you're growing food crops, it's never a bad thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so this is from Eugenia in um, Hokesson. My soil test came back low in phosphorus and I'm letting it revert back to natural with sedges, um, blue-eyed grass, etc. Should I add phosphorus? I would say um, yes, if your soil test came up low, I would add those. I mean, these plants generally have low nutritional needs, but if your soil's testing low um, with for phosphorus, um, it, I think it would be important to add that. Uh, phosphorus as an element typically um, remains pretty stable in the soil. So once you get phosphorus up to the desired level, there's no need to add any more. But um, typically disturbed soils, like those left behind from construction, are extraordinarily low in, in phosphorus. I've lived in my home for 22 years, and um, I just figured out probably five or six years ago that my lawn soil is short of phosphorus, and um, it's a slow process to bring it up but um, we're still working on it. So, um, so I would say yes. Um, in terms of how would I do it, it's a little easier if it's a new planting and you can, you know, kind of till up the soil because then you could add some triple superphosphate or use a balanced fertilizer that contains lots of phosphorus in its analysis. Um, the other thing you can do if you can prepare the soil before planting is, um, Mushroom compost is pretty high in phosphorus, so that would be um, a way to get some in there. And then um, bone meal and rock phosphate are also phosphorus sources. They're super slow release and they work better in um, when there's an acidifying agent. So an acid soil might release those two products at a more reasonable rate, otherwise they go pretty slow. 
It's a little more challenging if something's already established. Um, I would probably, you know, go for the superphosphate or secondary, the rock phosphate or the bone meal. One of the challenges of applying phosphorus materials is that you do not want them to run off of your property. Um, you want to uh, put them down in the right quantity, um, in the right place at the right time of year, uh, so the plants can, can use it and so it gets incorporated in the soil. Um, when phosphorus runs off and into our waterways, it's, uh, you know, it's damaging to the environment. That's good to know. And mushroom compost, that would be something I would imagine we could get around here. Mm -hmm. Aged mushroom compost is, that's something that when I first moved to my home and I established my vegetable gardens, I started a program of about every other year incorporating mushroom compost, um, you know, into my garden soil. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would definitely think that that's, that is something available, <laughs> at least in, in this area here um, in Chester County. Um, okay, so getting into a few questions about uh, preparation. So this, we have three questions here um, that are all generally about the same kinds of things. So um, Sue in Malvern, Kathy in Glen Mills, and Elwood in Collingdale. Um, so this is uh, in my vegetable garden, what's the best type of soil to use? How do I turn a section of grass with poor soil into a garden area? What amendments should I make to heavy clay soil. So a couple different things there um, mm -hmm. about preparation. And the, there's overriding principles. The best soil for any garden is well-drained and granular in texture. And um, you know, there's a whole spectrum of, uh, is my soil super sandy or is my soil super clayey? And regardless, um, the addition of organic matter is gonna improve um, soil tilt. So it, it allows um, you know, the development of a nice um, granular soil that allows water to percolate in and through um, the soil. Um, organic matter, as it decomposes, produces humic acid, which is kind of like a biological glue. And it, it glues um, soil, par soil particles together to create nice granules, which make a nice, um, what we call friable soil. So um, it's not something you can add all at once. I really only recommend adding, for example, if you're using mushroom compost as your compost soil, I would only add, or as your compost source, I would only add two inches um, at any one time. So basically take your plot and spread it over to the depth of two inches. Now, if I were to you know, take an area, you know, because we have some questions about improving um, spaces, some of them with plant material in place. In the case of Kathy, who's got some grass she wants to turn into a garden. Um, the first step is um, to remove the grass or any plant cover. So you can do that by hand. If it's sod, you can use the sod cutter. Um, you can use a short-acting non-selective herbicide to do that. I generally, if I'm prepping a garden space, I like to start in late summer or fall. So the first step is to, you know, to remove that um, plant debris from the top. The second step is really good if you can turn it by hand. So you can dig down with a spade six or eight inches and just flip it over and just keep going. It's a great job for a teenager if you've got one in the house. And then um, the next step is to run a tiller across it. It's great if you've got a tiller that will till down to six or eight inches. So then you rake it smooth, you add that two inches of organic matter, and then um, you till it in again. And then um, the next step as we're moving into late fall is to apply a cover crop like buckwheat. And buckwheat will grow and um, it will produce a cover and also so you know, your soil won't um, you know compete with weeds your soil won't erode or blow away <clears throat> and then um, it it can be tilled in to return nutrition to the earth and it, it, it adds even more um, organic matter 
Uh, the reason I like doing it in the fall is one, because of that decomposition process if you use a cover crop, and two, sometimes I think my mushroom compost in particular um, is a little drying and I really like to get it well incorporated. It can be a little hot too, meaning it's got a little of ammonium in it and, um, and so it can be a little salty. So a nice overwintering can get rid of that. And if you don't have access um, to aged mushroom compost, you can use composted leaf mold. Some people have access to vermicompost. And then kind of last resort, but still okay choice, is some sphagnum meat, peat moss. That you get at the garden center or the big box store. Um, it's not, it, it's acidifying, which is great, but it's, it's kind of not as efficient as the other sources of organic matter. Okay. And then, so we have another question about preparation. Um, do shredded leaves and grass clippings add organic matter to soil? Um, if my soil has no worms in it, what can I do to fix it? And this is from Marsha in Edison, New Jersey. Okay, so when I hear shredded leaves and I see grass clippings, I envision compost. Okay, so you can create your own compost. In fact, growing up, my father had a gigantic compost pile and he referred to it as black gold. <laughs> so he took all his shredded fall leaves and all his grass clippings and then um, vegetable um, debris from the kitchen, you know, peelings and things, and he created a compost. And um, if these materials are composted for several months, and allowed to break down, then that's your compost, that's your organic matter that you can incorporate just as, as I described in the last questions. Now, how do you create a compost? How do you maintain a compost? Go to your land grant institution, you know, type in Penn State Extension and then type in, you know, how do I create a compost? And there's gonna be a publication there that gives you some step-by-step -step on how to create a compost pile and maintain it. Right. Yeah. Um, which is something I think everybody can really do. Um, I mean, at least again, in this area with so many trees and um, so much growing that it's, it seems like it's a really easy thing to be able to do. Yeah. So if you have a smaller property or, um, you know, you don't have room or maybe your homeowners association don't allow you to have a compost pile, there are some, um, there's some composting equipment that you can actually buy kind of a tumbler looking device and um, so you can do it on a small scale yeah, that's uh, and then there's people who um, will grow worms which will um, you, know, you put your kitchen debris you know vegetable kitchen debris into um, you know the worm house and they'll create um, a compost for you as well huh that's really neat um I might have to actually check that out. That sounds like something that's also very easy to do, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to some fertilizer questions. Um, what soil and fertilizer advice do you have for rhododendrons? And this is from Catherine in Chester Springs. Okay, so rhododendrons, azaleas, blueberries are all acid-loving plants. Uh, we scientists call them ericaceous plants. So rhododendrons in particular prefer a soil pH of about 4.5 to 6. So the first step in terms of fertility for my rhododendrons is I take a soil test and find out what the pH is. And um, based on those results, you know, your extension service or your state lab is going to give you a recommendation as to how to um, use fertilizers to amend uh, the pH. Typically, I notice that they're recommending agricultural sulfur or iron sulfate, but I highly recommend that you get that test because you don't know how much to use or how many years it might take. That's, this is not a one-time thing. Um, changing the pH of field soils is difficult and it requires some patience. Um, so do, 
go with the recommendations. Now, rhododendrons also appreciate some annual fertilization. And you're going to find um, in your independent garden center or in your big box store fertilizers specifically recommended for acid loving plants. And I would choose those and use them as directed. So what they typically include are, for example, nitrogen sources that are a little more amenable to their um, growth habits. They'll also have some chelated iron because generally rhododendrons become iron deficient when the pH gets a little too high. So we'll have a source of iron that can't be affected by that um, soil pH that's too high. So in terms of general culture, we like to have our rhododendrons growing in well-drained situations. We like the soil to have lots of organic matter. So if you're starting with new plants, find a site with that. Um, also, rhododendrons like sheltered locations. They really don't tolerate windy sites and don't appreciate, um, you know, desiccating winter winds. They also have kind of a fine root system that tends to run very close to the surface of the soil. So a nice light covering of mulch to keep them moist and protected is a great idea. So again, I went searching for what I thought was the, the most um, readable extension bulletin on this topic. And I found that Virginia Tech had a great one uh, called Growing Azaleas and Rhododendron. I thought it was just a really well done piece. So if you wanna to go to Virginia Tech and their, web, you know, their extension website, and if you just type in um, to Google Virginia Tech Growing Azaleas and Rhododendrons, that publication will pick up. It'll just pop up in your feed. It seems like there's a lot of great resources that the cooperative extensions have too. So it's always a, I mean, aside from, you know, being able to submit questions and things like that, um, even just these kinds of materials that they produce. Uh, can Absolutely. Be really and, they're, and, they, and they produce a lot of materials for, of course, our, you know, our agriculture operators, um, but they also produce materials specific to homeowners, mm. which is very nice. And, you know, it's, it's a great service that each state yeah. provides. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so lilacs now, what is the best fertilizer for lilacs? This is from Kathleen in Westchester. Okay, so lilacs, um, in terms of you know, where they like to grow, they like sunny sites, they like great air circulation. So um, if your lilacs failing and they don't have a sunny site and a great air circulation, that can be problematic. They like well-drained soils and they prefer kind of a neutral pH. And they're not super fussy about fertility. So they're a fairly um, a, a lower uh, fertility plant. Um, you can actually give them a little too much fertility. It actually allows um, too much foliage and not enough flowers. Mm -hmm. So you want to be careful with that. Um, if you were to choose a fertilizer, you'd choose something with like um, a one to two to one ratio, which basically means there's twice as much phosphorus as there is nitrogen in the product. That's also gonna support more flowers and less foliage. So um, if you look for a flowering shrub product, it's likely to have less nitrogen and more phosphorus. For lilacs in particular, they prefer to be fertilized real early spring before bud break, okay? Whereas in our rhododendrons that we just talked about, those prefer to be fertilized basically, you know, late spring, early summer. So when they're actually putting on some new growth. So um, it turns out because they're not real heavy feeders, most people think that they really don't need fertilizer after about two or three years that, uh, that they're in the ground. So you're giving them some fertilizer during establishment, but uh, pretty much they're happy without too much fertilizer um, after that. If I were to choose a fertilizer for a lilac, I would tend to avoid the quicker acting water soluble products, but instead go for, um, you know, 
the fertilizer products, are, they're generally organic based, but they might have some synthetic mixed in with them. But what you get when you um, use those is you get a nice gradual, slow release. And, um, and then as soil microbes, you get the quicker release from the synthetic product and then you get um, a nice gradual, easy, slow release as the organic products break down and the, you know, the mineral ions become available to the plant. So there's lots of great formulations of those you know, at your independent garden center and um, at your big box stores. Yeah, and it sounds like, again, just it's sort of about knowing what your ratio should be for what you're, what you're growing. Mm -hmm. Generally, anything that's a flowering plant, for, you'll see the number for nitrogen be lower than the other two numbers. Great. And then same question, but for conifer. So recommendations for fertilizers for conifers, and this is from Gail in Westgrove. Okay, so conifers actually don't need too much nutrition either. Turns out that um, when they're young and establishing, and you kind of think that they're not growing, they actually are producing a lot of roots underground. You just don't see a lot of top growth because they're doing all that work underground. So really for the first year of their life in your yard, um, we really don't need to use any fertilizers on conifers. And then, you know, during the second and third year, um, you know, you can you do a little if you'd like to. If it's a mature um, conifer and it looks healthy, you don't need to do anything. Some warning signs would be um, off-color needles, um, shorter needles than usual, and then in the spring, a lot of conifers produce these tips we call the candles. It's the new growth on the tip of the stem. And if those are shorter, um, then you'd want to uh, consider a fertility treatment. Um, the first thing I'd want to do, though, is eliminate an insect or disease problem first, because those are more likely on conifers. We've got a lot of needle cast fungi problems going on on conifers, so I'd be want to want to eliminate those and to be perfectly honest if i had a mature conifer tree that I was concerned about i'd call a consulting arborist <laughs> mm -hmm. and i'd ask them to evaluate for insects and disease and if we found it was a fertility issue they have um, great products that they apply to the trees through what we call injections so it's just a a machine that pokes a hole in the ground and pumps fertilizer solution or, you know, to the feeder roots. So now if you're a do-it-yourself person, I would send it out for a soil test, say it's conifers, and they would give you a recommendation for what to apply. So they'll give you an amount. And if you look online, there's two ways to apply. You know, sometimes it's surface apply, but a lot of times you're gonna have to create holes in two foot spacings around the perimeter of the tree and put fertilizer into, into those holes. Um, that's what, why the, the injection method done by the arborist is better, but there are um, recommendations and you should take those from your soil tests. Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's the professional way, there's the do-it-yourself way. <laughs> yeah, and really only if you're seeing, you know, off-color needles and poor growth would you even mm -hmm. bother doing you know being concerned about it at all great and then this is our last question and then if we have anything for questions for Nancy um, we can take those as well uh, this question is from Joseph Joseph in Agua Massachusetts I have two to four I have a two to four year old apple tree that won't bear fruit the grass is heavy in that area what could that be about what's the reason for that Okay, so most apple trees um, do not bear tree don't do not bear fruit till they're three to five years old. So in apple trees, there's what we call uh, there exists juvenility, and they're just simply too young uh, to produce fruit. So they could be in the juvenile non-bearing stage. Now the presence of heavy turf grass under the tree can slow a tree down in, you know, moving through juvenility into adulthood when it would start producing um, apples. 
and because grasses uh, compete for water and nutrition and um, kind of slow down this progress. However, now would I remove the turf? Um, if it's in a small suburban yard I would, and you're managing the turf well, um, I would say leave it there and just be a little bit patient because the advantage of having some turf is better than not. Um, if you're you know, if you have like a little mini orchard, um, generally speaking, they do clear the area from weeds and grass right under the tree. And then they have strips of, of um, grasses that you walk on between the trees. So that's used as a kind of a, you know, weed control agent. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the issues that can occur for homeowners that have fruit trees is that um, too much nitrogen can again leave you with more foliage than fruit. Mm -hmm. So they recommend that if you do have a fruit tree in your yard that you um, look at your tree and establish where the drip line is and that's you know the ends of the branches all the way around the perimeter of the tree is called the drip line. You're not supposed to be applying lawn fertilizer any closer than five feet from that drip line. So that's leaving quite, if you've got grass growing up you know, around your tree, that's quite an area. So I'd just be super careful on, you know, my lawn applications, keep them away from the trees because it could be too much nitrogen, mm -hmm. which would promote foliage and discourage flower and fruit formation. Great, great. And we do have one question that came in through the chat. We um, can certainly answer uh, maybe a couple of others too, but this is from Albert. Um, my geranium blooms are small and not opening. What could be wrong? They're potted hanging baskets. Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, there's a couple of things that can happen. I've had that happen usually in late summer, early fall when I've got um, some little caterpillars that bore into the flower buds and basically destroy them. So um, the other reason why um, you know flowers might not progress to flowering uh, could be that the plants are under some stress. Either it's too much water or not enough water they might be um, you know you know, lacking something they need or have too much water, lacking, which in that case is lacking um, oxygen. Um, if it were me, I'd probably just sort of remove the, um, the blind flower buds and then, um, you know, check my soil, check my, my, soil, uh, my soil quality, check my um, watering habits and my fertility habits and see if that brings it out of it. Sometimes they have a cold spell too. You know, kind of when I first put my geraniums out in their pots, I will see that happen as well. They, I will lose the buds and then the next, you know, phase of flowers are, are fine. Okay, great. Um, Nancy, any final thoughts on um, either growing with soil or using and applying fertilizer? Well, I kind of have three take home messages that I made a note of. Um, one of the things I think is important for everyone to remember is that you want to start with great quality soil and great quality soil preparation. So whether you're growing something in a container, you want to select your best potting mix. If you're, if you're you know, creating a perennial garden or a rose garden or establishing a lawn, the first um, rule for success is to get kind of your house in order in terms of soil. Uh, so that'll make everything, and it'll, you'll be successful. Um, also protect the soil um, and treat it well. So soil is kind of the basis of good plant growing. Um, the second take home message is in regards to soil testing. Uh, test, don't guess. <laughs> so soil testing is a great tool for gardeners. It doesn't take a lot of dollars or a lot of effort to do a soil test. So test, don't guess. And then um, please, my third um, take home message is use all your fertilizers in accordance to the label instructions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
and and then if you have a recommendation from your state lab follow that recommendation some people think that more fertilizer product is better but in fact overuse of fertilizer is more harmful to plants than underuse of fertilizer and then in the outdoors you know we have the potential to damage our environment if we over apply in the garden yeah always read the label <laughs> universal advice uh great well thank you nancy for joining us today um this as i mentioned this session is recorded and it will be available on our website um and we thank you all for joining us today we're grateful for your en engagement and support throughout this time um, and as a reminder this friday we will be opening to members uh, member reservations are required and you can look for a more great content in our weekly longwood from home emails so thank you so much for everybody who joined today and we will I'll see you soon.